Okay, so then Yehovah said to Moshe, stretch out your hand over the sea and let the waters come back on the Mithraites, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moshe stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its usual flow at the break of day with the Mithraites fleeing into it. Thus Yehovah overthrew the Mithraites in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, and not even one of them was left. Okay, so I have very subtly drawn your attention here to a repeating theme which is throughout this passage of scripture. Can anyone see what it is? <laughs> okay, the sea is mentioned. This is an incredibly, incredibly, um, I don't know, it was just amazing. I remember when Yehovah began to show me this when I was doing the life after death teachings. Um, and he's, he's just shown me more and more about it this week. So I'll go through it with you. Well, we've got what we would think of as the sea. Okay. And that is what we think of as the ocean. The oceans that are on the earth are not the only sea which is mentioned in scripture. Okay. We also have what is called the deep the deep is mentioned in scripture, isn't it? And that is under the earth. We've got the heavens and we've got the earth. And then we've got Sheol under the earth. And where Sheol is, is a place called the deep. In the flood of Noah, it says that he opened the fountains of the deep. That some of the water came from the fountains of the deep. He opened the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven. And we hear a lot about the deep. And we're going to look at it. But that is another sea. And it turns out that in the end, it's going to be a very interesting place that we um, are all familiar with, at least the concept of, and that is the lake of fire. So let's get into it. Luke 8, 26 to 33. They sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galil. And as he went out onto the land, he was met by a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. He wore no garments and he was living, he was not living in a house, but in the terms. And when he saw Yeshua, he cried out, fell down before him and with a loud voice said, what have I to do with you, Yeshua, son of the most high Elohim? I beg you, do not torment me. So something I want you to hold on to out of this is that he asked him not to torment him. When he's talking about tormenting him, he's not talking about physically torturing him. It's mental torment, which is discussed here. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times and he was bound with chains and shackles being guarded. And breaking the bonds, he was driven by the demon into the lonely places. And Yeshua asked him saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered into him. And they were begging him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Okay, in Greek, the abyss is tain abyson. Okay, well, it's tain abuson. From the Greek word abyson. So, these demons... Don't want Yeshua to cast them out of the man into this place that is called the abyss. So let's see what else we can find out about this place called the abyss throughout scripture. In Revelation 9, 1 to 2, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from the heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key to the bottomless pit was given to it. We think, the bottomless pit, okay. Bottomless pit, that's different to the abyss, isn't it? Well, is it? In Greek, it says freer, which is the Greek word for pit. And then it says tes abusu. Okay, tes abusu. Just the same word, just a modified version of the Greek word abyson, like uh, the other one that we saw for the abysses. It, it's referring to the abyss. It says pit, the abyss. What the abyss actually should literally be translated as is the bottomless, 
Okay, so when they says, do not cast us out into the abyss, what they're asking is, do not cast, cast us out into the bottomless. Here, we just have another noun used. It's the bottomless pit, or pit the bottomless, pit the bottomless, is what it literally says. So don't cast us into the bottomless. This is talking about the bottomless pit. It says, and he opened pit the bottomless, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun was darkened, also the air, because of the smoke of the pit. Okay, and this is the same abyss which was referred to by the demons to not cast us into there. In Revelation 20, 1 to 3, we see it used again. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he seized the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into pit the bottomless, shut him up, set a seal on him so that he should no more lead the nations astray until the thousand years were ended. Okay, now what I want to do is show you this verse in the ISR. In the ISR version of the scriptures, this is what it says. I saw an angel coming down from the heaven, having the key to the pit of the deep. That is more accurately what it says. It could say the pit of the bottomless. As we saw in Greek, it's pit the bottomless and the word of is implied there. So why is it translating it as pit of the deep? Why is it the deep? He seized the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, and he threw him into the pit of the deep. So every time the bottomless pit is used in some translations, pit of the deep is used in the ISR translation. And as I say, it's a more accurate translation. Pit of the bottomless, possibly. Well, pit of the deep. So why is it saying pit of the deep? Why is it translating uh, Tain Abyssin as the deep? Well, if we look in the Septuagint version, Okay, we look at Genesis 1 verse 2. It says, The earth was unsightly and unfurnished, and darkness was over the deep. That's what it says in the English, but in the Greek, again, it uses that word, tain abusson, the abyss. Darkness was over the face of the abyss. So when, everything, when he created the heavens and the earth, he also created the abyss, and darkness was over the face of the abyss, or the bottomless. Same thing. Romans 10, 6 to 7 says, But the righteousness of belief speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who shall ascend into the heavens, that is to bring Messiah down, or who shall descend into the abyss, Tain Abusson, that is to bring Messiah up from the dead. Okay, now it's interesting, because we're talking about the sea, aren't we? Paul here is actually quoting from a Hebrew passage. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 30. And in Deuteronomy 30, it doesn't say the deep or the abyss or anything like that. It says, it's not in the heavens to say who shall ascend into the heavens for us and bring it to us and cause us to hear it so that we do it. Nor is it beyond the sea. So where the Greek translates the Hebrew, the sea, it says the abyss or the deep. Because he's not talking about who will go down to the bottom of the sea on earth. He's saying, who will go into heavens, the highest you can go? Who will go into the abyss, the lowest that you can go? And interestingly, in the Aramaic, it says, or who descends to the abyss of Sheol, tells us where it is, and brings up Mashiach again from the house of the dead. Sheol is the house of the dead, and the abyss is in Sheol. Sheol is on the sides of the abyss, as we'll see. In Revelation 11, verse 7, we get something else that links the bottomless pit, the bottomless, the deep, all these things with the sea. It says, and when they ed have ended their witness, the beast coming up out of the bottomless pit, right there, the beast coming up out of the bottomless pit. There's only two beasts mentioned in Revelation. One of them comes from the earth. The other one comes up out of the sea. So you see the sea and the bottomless pit are connected here. Again, in Revelation 17, 8, it says, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the bottomless pit. There's only one beast coming up and it comes up out of what is called the sea. So we've got the pit, the bottomless, the abyss, the deep, the sea. These are all, 
all terms for the same thing and they're all used interchangeably as we can see throughout scripture. Psalm 146 verse 6 says, Maker of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Okay, not talking about the sea on the earth because that's part of the earth. That's one of the oceans on the earth. He's maker of the highest thing, the heavens, the earth, and the sea, the lowest thing. Matthew 12, 43 says something very interesting. Now, if you remember in the creation narrative, you know that the firmament, Harakia, okay, that is that separates the waters above from the waters below. What is above the firmament is the heavens. So the realm of the heavens is in water. And there is this link throughout scripture of the spiritual realm and water. In heaven, it's water. The whole realm is in water. In the demons that didn't want to get cast out, they didn't want to go into the abyss, which is the sea where there is water. Okay, and in Matthew twelve forty three, and this is in the Aramaic, I didn't label it as such, but it is. It says, now when an unclean spirit goes out from a man, it wanders in places that have no water in them. So when you cast a spirit out of somebody, it says dry places in the Greek. The Aramaic, it specifies that there's no water in them, and that's what it is literally written there. So it seems that spirits like to dwell in water. We've got the abyss where they don't want to be sent. That's water. Heaven, that's water. And in people, what are we made up? The majority of what we're made up from is water, of course. So when you cast out a spirit, it wanders around in places that have no water in them. Revelation 21 verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth have passed away, and the sea is no more. If this was talking about the ocean, then it would be part of the earth, wouldn't it? New heavens, new earth. And it says the sea is no more. He's maker of the heavens, the earth, and the sea. The sea is no more. So what is no more in the new heavens and the new earth? The bottomless pit, the pit, the deep, the abyss. That's what is no more. Genesis 1 verse 2 in the Hebrew it says, and the earth came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And in, in the Hebrew, it's ha te home. Te home being deep, ha meaning the. So ha te home. Where else do we see this? Proverbs 8, 22 to 24. Yahovah possessed me, the beginning of his way, at the f as his first of his works of old. The first of Yahovah's works was to bring wisdom forth. Obviously, no time, no space, it's just Yehovah. The first thing he brings about is his wisdom in a manifest form. I was set up ages ago at the first, before the earth ever was, when there were no depths, when there was no Tehom, when the deep, the pit, the abyss wasn't there. Because what does it say is first, darkness was on the face of of the abyss after he makes the heavens and the earth. So before the earth ever was, and before the deep was there, I was brought forth. Job 28, 13 to 14 says, man does not know its value or his value. It's and his are the same in Hebrew. And it is not found in the land of the living. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna hear about something that's not in the land of the living. The land of the living is everything that happens underneath the sun. Sheol is not under the sun, as we find out from Ecclesiastes. Which is why people get confused about verses, about people not knowing anything in Sheol, and then not knowing anything about what is done under the sun, which does not include Sheol. So it's not found in the land of the living. Hatehom has said, it is not in me. And the sea has said, it is not with me. This is what you call a Hebrew parallelism. That's where you say two things that are the same thing, and it emphasizes what is being said. So the deep says it's not in me, the sea says it's not with me. Okay, it's the same thing said in two different ways, the deep and the sea, of course, being linked. And it's not found in the land of the living, which these are not in. Job 38, 16 to 17 says, Have you come to the sources of the sea? Or have you walked about in the recesses of the deep, Hate home, what the darkness was on the face of? Okay, so the sea and the deep linked here as well. Now we've got some very interesting 
phrasing used that says, were the gates of death revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? All of these things are talking about the same thing, the sources of the sea. Now, as we'll see, the sea has got gates on it. It's got bars and it's got doors on it. Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? It's an interesting phrase, the shadow of death. Okay. If we look at Psalm 88, 1 to 6 in the Hebrew, first of all, it says, Oh, Yehovah, Elohim of my deliverance, Elohim of my Yeshua. By day I have cried out, in the night also before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is filled with evils, and my life draws near to Sheol. Okay, so we're talking about things that happen to do with Sheol. I have been reckoned among those who go down to the pit. So in Sheol, you've got two groups of people. You've got those with Abraham, and you've got those on the side of Sheol that are going to go to destruction. And going to destruction is to go down to the pit, scripturally speaking. I have become like a man who has no strength, released among the dead, like slain ones lying in the grave, whom you have remembered no more and who have been cut off from your hand. You have put me in the lowest pit in dark places, in Hatehom, in the Hebrew, it says in Hatehom. The rest of this is the same in the Greek. But when you come to verse 6, it says, They laid me in the lowest place, in dark places, in the shadow of death. What did we read in Job 38? Have you come to the gates of the shadow of death? Okay. The shadow of death is used, but instead, in the Hebrew, you've got the depths. There's the connection there between the two. So have you come to the sources of the sea, walked in the recesses of Hatehom? Were the gates of death revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? This is all to do with the deep, it's all to do with the sea. Earlier in Job 38, it says, Or who enclosed the sea with doors? Is the ocean enclosed with doors? Anyone seen the doors of the ocean? No, it's talking about the deep. When it burst forth and came from the womb, when I made the clouds its, dark, its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. What did we hear in Genesis 1-2? Darkness was on the face of the deep. Darkness was the thick swaddling band on the sea, which is enclosed with doors. And I and assigned for it my law and set bars and doors. Okay, so this deep, the pit, the bottomless, the abyss, the sea has bars and doors on it which makes sense when we read that we saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit. Okay, if it's got gates and bars and doors on them, then a key would make sense. Previously, it's just like, what? what's the key to the bottomless pit? It's a bit weird. Great chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, and he threw him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. Okay, so... Now all of this starts to make sense, doesn't it? Revelation 20, 12 to 14. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Do you think this is all the, uh, the mariners who've died at sea? It's probably not, is it? Death and Sheol gave up the dead who were in them. So you've got death and Sheol giving up the dead and the sea giving up the dead that are in it. Interesting that there are dead in the sea at the time and we'll come on to that as we go on. And they were judged, each one according to his works and the death and Sheol were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So death and Sheol are thrown into the lake of fire. Why isn't the sea thrown into the lake of fire? Well, the sea, as it turns out, ends up being the lake of fire. Okay, we have all these parallels drawn throughout scripture of water being the first judgment and then fire being the later judgment. The sea at the moment is water. The sea will be fire. So you've got the dead coming from the sea. You've got the dead coming from death and Sheol. And then you've got death and Sheol being thrown into the sea, which is the lake of fire and the dead after having been judged, will be thrown into the lake of fire too. 
2 Peter 3, 5 to 7. For they choose to have this hidden from them, that the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by the word of Elohim, through which the world at that time was destroyed. Destruction coming by water, being flooded with water. And the present heavens and the earth are treasured up by the same word, okay, the word which is the underlying foundation of all events, being kept for fire for a day of judgment and destruction. So first the destruction is by water, the future it will be by fire, and it's the same with the sea. Mark 5:13 also gives us an interesting parallel between the sea and the lake of fire. Okay, this is the same story of Yeshua coming across this guy with demons and him casting the demons out of them and they, they go into the pigs, don't they? And it says, he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. They were about 2,000. And the herd rushed down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So you've got the unclean spirits being destroyed in the sea here. Interesting, it uses the Greek word, the sea. In Luke 8, 31 to 33, it says they were begging him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. That's the one under the earth. And a herd of many pigs was feeding there on the mountain. They begged him to allow them to go into them, and he allowed them. And the demons, having gone out of the man, entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down to the steep place into the lake and drowned. Same word that's used for the lake of fire. So we've got the sea and the lake being contrasted in the two gospel accounts. Job 33, 24 says, Then he shows favor to him and says, Release him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. So this is important. Our ransom is Yeshua. We are freed from under the power of death. Okay, the power of death is the second death in Sheol. And it's in the hands of of Hasatan. And it's when we go down into the sea that we are consumed by the fire. And it's interesting, we'll get to Jonah later on, but Jonah calls the sea the stomach of Sheol, where the dead are consumed. We're ransomed from under the power of death, which is in the hands of Hasatan. And this is what is prophetically spoken of here. Release him from going down to the pit to the sea, to the abyss, to the bottomless, to the stomach of Sheol, I have found a ransom which is Yeshua. Isaiah 51, 10 to 11 says, Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? This is how it is spoken of in our story with the Exodus. Okay, he let the ones he'd redeemed from Egypt pass over the sea. This is talking about when he dried up the sea and the redeemed passed over. It's talking about historical exodus. The next verse is talking about the future. It says, let the ransomed of Yehovah return, those who have been ransomed so that they don't go down into the pit. They shall come to Sion with singing and everlasting joy on their heads. Let them attain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So hold on to the fact that when the ransomed of Yehovah, hopefully us, return, we will go to Sion, we will go to Zion, okay? Isaiah 35, eight to 10 talks of this same event. It says, there shall be a highway and a way, and it shall be called the way of set apartness, the way of holiness. The unclean does not pass over it, but it is for those who walk the way and no fools wander on it. No lion is there, nor any ravenous beast go up on it. It is not found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. The ransomed of Yehovah shall return and enter Sion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Same language that's used. This is when a way is made for the ransomed who will not go down to the pit to pass over. Yeshua describes Sheol for us, and we'll get on to that. Psalm 68 verse 22 says, Yehovah said, I bring back from Bishon, I bring back from the depths the sea. This is where he brings back from. Okay, this is where we are going to be brought back from as the ransomed of Yehovah, Yehovah who do not go down into the pit. 
Luke 16, 19 to 26 says, But there was a certain rich man who used to dress in purple and fine linen and live luxuriously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Eletzar being covered with sores who was placed at his gate and longing to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Indeed, even the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to be that the beggar, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. Some translations say Abraham's bosom, and everyone thinks that this place is called Abraham's bosom. It just means he was carried to where Abraham was, with Abraham. Interestingly, he's carried by the angels there. We know, and we've looked at before, that the trees of Eden are in Sheol. The, the paradise of God is in Sheol. Yeshua said, today you will be with me in paradise, which is in Sheol, which is where he went and spent three days in the heart of the earth. Okay, what do we know about the Garden of Eden after man was kicked out of it? There are angels guarding it. It's interesting that when you get taken to paradise, when you die, the beggar died and he was carried by the angels. The rich man that also died and was buried. And while being in torment, there's that word again, the same word. When the demons said, do not torment me, Yeshua, they weren't saying, oh, don't get your, your torture instruments out. They were talking about mental torment. And that's exactly what's being spoken of here. You can imagine being on the side of Sheol where you know your end is to end up in the pit. It would torment you, which is exactly what it's talking about. Having lifted up his eyes, he saw Abraham far away and Eletzar in his bosom. And crying out, he said, Father Abraham, have compassion on me. Send Eletzar to dip uh, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented by this flame. Not in this flame. The word in and by are the same word in Greek. It's a mistranslation to be tormented in the flame. He's tormented by the flame. It says cool in the Greek and it unequivocally says cool. But in the Aramaic, it says moisten. Moisten my tongue with water. So I don't know which one's right could be the Greek is right. What we do know, as we've looked at, is that the dead who are not those who go down to the pit are comforted in Sheol with water. That's what it says in Ezekiel. The ones who go down to the pit, they are not comforted. And this is what Abraham says. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your life you received the good and likewise Eletar the evil. But now he is comforted with water and you are tormented. And this guy either wants him to cool or moisten his tongue with water. I would suggest that moisten is more in line with what we know doctrinally, but it could well be cool. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set. In Greek, chasma. Okay, and it doesn't mean necessarily an expanse of open space. It's only used once in the Greek New Testament. It can mean a space that is filled with water as well. It's an expanse, basically, a great expanse. So you've got the two sides of Sheol, and in between is this great expanse. And this great expanse is the sea or the deep, which is spoken of. So that those who wish to pass from here to you are unable, nor do those from there pass to us. Now, if you remember before, it said that the, the dead that were in the sea... We, the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Yeah? So there are dead that are in the sea that Yeshua is coming. Or after the thousand years when people are judged by their works. So that those who wish to pass from here to you are unable. They're unable to pass over. So we've got the two sides of Sheol. We've got the pit, the sea, the deep in the middle. Isaiah 14, 15 says, you're brought down to Sheol. It tells us where it is, the sides of the pit. This is the great expanse, which is between the two sides. Proverbs 27, verse 1, I'm going to suggest this is the reason why people are unable to cross over and why there are dead in the sea. In that day, Yehovah, with his severe sword, great and strong, punishes Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent. He shall slay the monster that is in the sea. Is that a monster in the ocean? No. It's the sea under the earth. That's where Leviathan is. And we find out something very interesting about Leviathan. 
in Amos 9.3, it says, And if they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I shall search and take them. And if they hide from before my eyes at the bottom of the sea, from there I shall command the serpent and it shall bite them. So this serpent can be commanded by Yehovah, and that's going to be interesting when we get into the book of Jonah. Uh, possibly it might be in the next part. Okay, where he'll command the serpent. If people go into the sea, Yehovah can command the serpent and it bites them. So people are unable to cross from one side to the other. And there are dead that are in the sea. Perhaps people who tried to make the journey. So back to the Parsha, it says, Then Yehovah said to Moshe, Stretch out your hands over the sea and let the waters come back on the Mitrites, the Egyptians, those people of the world, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moshe stretched out out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its usual flow at the break of day. Remember, a way is going to be made for us, the redeemed, to pass over. And it's paralleled with when Yehovah brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He made the sea into dry land. That's what it says, although we know that he didn't do that. It's prophetic of what happens with the sea that is in Sheol, when a way is made for us to pass over as the ransomed of Yehovah. Return to its usual flow at the break of day with the Mitrites fleeing into it. Thus Yehovah overthrew the Mitrites in the midst of the sea. I do wonder whether when the Mitrites, those on the other side of Sheol, are watching those in Abraham's bosom cross over the sea and it becomes dry land and they go from Sheol whether or not they then rush into the sea as if they're going to be delivered in the same way and the sea is returned to its usual flow. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them and not even one was left of them. In Revelation 19:20, it says, The beast was seized and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence. Remember the beast was given his throne and his authority as a part of Hasatan's kingdom by the dragon, who is Hasatan, who worked signs in his presence, by which he also led astray those who received the mark of the beast, those who worshipped his image. The two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, burning with sulfur. So we do have Pharaoh and his army cast into the lake of fire. The children of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. Thus Yehovah saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Mitzrites, and Israel saw the Mitzrites dead on the seashore. Which is interesting because we are told that we have received salvation, which is to be cleansed of our sins. At that point, we're washed clean of our sins and we're given garments of salvation, robes of righteousness to wear, which we can defile. Peter says that from that point onwards, our faith is tested, worth more than gold, because when we're tested, we're not refined by literal fire, we're refined by these trials so that our faith may be found worthy of him for that salvation which is to be revealed when he is revealed. There is a salvation which happens when Yeshua is revealed, if we have not defiled our garments when we get to that point. Thus Yehovah saved Yisrael that day when they crossed over the sea. That's the salvation that we look forward to when we receive our incorruptible bodies. And Yisrael saw the great work which Yehovah had done in Mitraim, and the people feared Yehovah and believed Yehovah and his servant Moshe. Can you imagine the scene in Sheol? When if we die before he comes, we'll have been living in Sheol until he comes. And suddenly there's a way made for us to pass over this great chasm. And to come out of Sheol is the redeemed of Yehovah. Can you imagine what the scene's going to be like for us and how thankful we're going to be in that day? And how jubilant and amazed we're going to be in that day? Then Moshe and the children of Israel sang this song to Yehovah and spoke saying, I sing to Yehovah for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he's thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and my song, and has become my Yeshua. He is my ale, and I praise him, Elohim of my father, and I exalt him. 
Yahovah is a man of battle. Yahovah is his name. He has cast Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea, and his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. Hatehom covered them the deep again. Okay, so it starts to use language, suggestive of the fact that it's not just talking about this event which happens then. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Yehovah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O Yehovah, has crushed the enemy. Who's his right hand? Shishua. What does Genesis tell us will happen when Hasatan bruises Yeshua's heel? He will crush the enemy, Hasatan. Jonah 2. Jonah prayed to Yehovah, his Elohim, from the stomach of the fish. So make no mistake, when he's doing this, he is at the bottom of the ocean on the earth. He said, I called to Yehovah because of my distress, and he answered me. From the stomach of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Where is he? He's in the sea. We are consumed in Sheol. Psalm 49 says, death will feed upon them. Okay, metaphorical language. Consumed in the stomach of Sheol. From the stomach of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. Where is he? He's in the stomach of the fish at the bottom of the sea. For you threw me into Hatehom, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your breakers and your waves passed over me. So I said, I have been driven away from your eyes. Would I ever look again towards your set apart temple? Waters encompassed me unto life. Hate home enclosed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the base of the mountains. The earth with its bars were left behind me forever. But you brought up my life from the pit, from the freer in Greek, the freer tain abyssin. O Yehovah, my Elohim. So you see in this account, how the literal oceans on the earth and the sea under the earth are mixed up and the metaphors that are used are all mixed up to show us that there's a link between the two. When my life fainted within me, I remembered Yehovah and my prayer went up to you in your set apart temple. Those observing lying vapors forsake their own kindness. But I sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I pay what I have vowed. Yeshua is of Yehovah. Then Yehovah spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. The fish, the great fish, which is at the bottom of the ocean, he spoke to it. What did he say that he would do to the serpent, which is at the, in the sea under the earth? He said that he would command the serpent. Parallel again. Verse 7 says, And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath and it consumed them like stubble. The waters are water. His wrath is always fire. Being consumed like stubble is something that is said of fire. It's not said of water. And yet they're using this to describe what happens when the sea comes back on the Egyptians. It's prophetic. With the wind of, the, of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up. The flood stood still like a wall. Hatehom became dense in the heart of the sea. Is that what happened when they crossed over? Or did he move by the east wind? Did he part the sea and they walked over on dry land? This is what will happen in the future when a way is made for the ransom to pass over. The depths became dense or became thickened is what the word means, which is exactly what he was talking about when we read before, that he made the sea into dry land. It's not literally what he did in that case, but it is literally what he will do when we, as the redeemed, pass over. The enemy said, I pursue, I overtake, I divide the spoil. My soul is satisfied on them. I draw out my sword, my hand destroys them. You did blow with your ruach, with your wind. The sea covered them. Or you did blow with your spirit, and the sea covered them in the prophetic sense. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Yehovah, among the gods? Who is like you, great in set apartness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Another phrase which is used when we hear about Sheol, the earth swallowed them up and they went alive into Sheol. In your kindness, you led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you guided them to your set apart dwelling. 
Really? Did he? When they crossed over the Red Sea, did he lead them to Mount Zion? Didn't, did he? This is prophetic of the future. He didn't lead them to his set apart dwelling. He led them to the other side of the Sea of Reeds. This is prophetic. People's heard they trembled, anguish gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab trembling grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan melted. Fear and dread fell upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are as silent as a stone until your people pass over. O Yehovah, until the people whom you have bought pass over. Imagine the scene in Sheol when the sea is made dense and the ransomed of Yehovah pass over. Imagine the scene on the other side of Sheol. All of the kings of Edom, the inhabitants of Philistia, the people of the world look on and see the ransomed of Yehovah passing over the sea, silent as a stone. Which is what we heard about before in Isaiah 52. He likewise does sprinkle many nations. Concerning him, kings shut their mouths, their silent as a stone. For that which had not been recounted to them, they have seen, and indeed they will. And what they had not heard, they have understood. And they will in that day. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. That's Mount Sion. He didn't do that. He will for us. In the place, O Yehovah, which you have made for your own dwelling, the set-apart place, O Yehovah, which your hands have prepared. Where did Yeshua say that he was going? What was he going to do for us? He was going to prepare a place for us, wasn't he? Yehovah reigns forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and the horsemen into the sea. And Yehovah brought back the waters of the sea upon them. And the children of Israel went on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Again, when we've passed over the sea, I would be surprised if the people on the other side of Sheol didn't like the Egyptians rush into the midst of the sea as if they were going to make it over too. And Miriam the prophetess, the, si the sister of Aharon, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancers. And Miriam answered them, okay, sing to Yehovah. That's what she says. For he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he is thrown into the sea. So if we think of this, when we cross over the sea, let's see what prophecy says. I saw a sea of glass mixed with fire. I've always thought this was in heaven. I don't think it's in heaven. I saw a sea of glass mixed with fire. Okay, the sea made hard. It becomes the lake of fire. Those overcoming the beast in his image and his mark and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass with harps of Elohim. Just like when they passed over and they've got timbrels and the musical instruments. They sang, they sing the song of Moshe. It's always been unclear what is the song of Moshe. Is it Hazinu, or is it this song which is sung then? It's this song. Prophetically, it happens in exactly the same way. They sing the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. That's exactly what they've just said. Yehovah El Shaddai, righteous and true are your ways, O King of the set-apart ones. The ransomed of Yehovah shall return and enter Sion with singing. Exactly the same. Ransomed of Yehovah, return over the way that's made for them. And they enter into his holy mountain, which is what the song of Moshe is about. They enter in with singing. 